Hey guys, welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. Once again, check for dumbest and most obvious reasons first. My parents had me facepalm so hard yesterday. They're both nearing 70, but they were engineers and are pretty good with computers and with figuring things out when they don't know something. So they mainly call me when they hit language barriers. Neither knows English, and Father's engineering program said it is default on reinstallation. Same with software for our old printer. Yesterday's call was about said printer. Old laptop refused to see it no matter what they did, including running installation disk. 15 minutes on the phone and several WhatsApp photos later, I had to admit I can't troubleshoot it from work, and will have to come over in the evening. Whatever they needed wasn't urgent, so they had already left when I came and found the source of the problem. Two engineers put a USB cable into an Ethernet port and didn't question it, even when it kept falling out. Just put a notepad under it to keep it in place. <laughs> when I called them, both said that they weren't 100% sure that, that it was right port, but thought that other would have corrected it if it wasn't. Yep, even engineers miss the obvious stuff sometimes. Some like it hot. This story is short but sweet. My IT department benefits from having both a front-facing customer desk as well as a back office for hands and feet. I'm manning the front desk one crisp winter day when an accountant brings in her laptop for support. I greet her as she comes in and she has a noticeable Latin accent, important for later. But her English is excellent, so it's not like I'm having trouble understanding her. She explains that she's having issues with her PC shutting off randomly while she's working. I ask how often and she describes it happening every half hour or so. Hmm, unusual but not unheard of. So assuming it's some kind of hardware issue, I start troubleshooting by running diagnostics. But they come back fine. Whatever, I ever try to log in and try to replicate what she was doing when it last crashed. Time passes and nothing. I'm stumped. Everything seems to be working as intended. So we talk it up to the ghost in the machine being on a smoke break. I send her off with the instructions to give me a call should it start acting up again. Sure enough, about a half hour later she sends out the SOS. At this point I'm fairly certain there's something wrong with her setup. I get her desk location and let her know not to touch anything because I'm on my way. I get to her office and when she lets me in I notice the air seems considerably warmer even though the heat is on for the entire building. I just write it off as the cubicles being close to a vent or something and move to put a steadying hand on her desk so I can lean on her to take a look at the outlet. Mistake. The cubicle desk is surprisingly hot. I sort of recoil on surprise, <laughs> which also startled the customer and bend my knees a bit to try and get another look under the hood. Yup, sure enough, she's got a personal heater on full blast right underneath her setup. I ask her about it. Turns out this lady's from Brazil and our Midwestern winners are just driving her insane. I explained to her the amount of heat was likely too much for the CPU and was probably causing the computer to shut down because of it. Trying to be sympathetic, I suggest moving the heater out from underneath the desk for now and maybe getting some cheap risers to keep the computer above the desktop since she was working with a docking station anyway. She swings by later to let us know that moving the heater seemed to resolve the problem. No word on whether or not she went with the elevated PC suggestion, though. Yeah, it can be pretty tough when you change in climates like that drastically. Brazil is definitely a little different than the Midwest. And on a side note, I know the last couple videos, at least, have uh, been a little out of sync with the picture and speech, so I think I've got it figured out, but I won't know until I'm done editing this. So if you're watching me say this, and it's out of sync, I'm sorry. Still working on it. I can't see that, the lights are off. We currently work for a small software company developing our own product. Our users tend to be middle-aged onwards, so we do have some difficult users at times. As most of our clients don't have a clue about computers, they tend to ring us even though we just support the software. We help them as much as possible though. One day though, I received a call from a very clever user who should really have known better. We also supplied this guy's PC a few years ago. He rang up to question why his PC had all of a sudden turned off. My first thought was it was an older PC. It would be a possible PSU issue, but no, it was worse. As the call went on, we tried as much as possible to try and boot it up, but in the end it wasn't having it. The guy mumbled something about his laptop still working, but I didn't register that at the time. Fatal error. I then asked the guy to have a look under the desk and make sure that all the cables were plugged in correctly. He then replied, I'll try, but I can't see a lot as all the lights are off. We had a power cut 15 minutes ago. 
I'll go get a torch. <laughs> At this point, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I explained to the guy what happened and he took it fairly well. He got the power back on and amazingly the PC worked again. It's funny, I used to get really confused and ticked off when I'd hear these stories or read these stories because you would think it would be common sense that, you know, power's out, electric stuff doesn't work because there's no electric. But I think what really happened here is over time, cell phones and tablets and laptops have, oh my. have kind of ruined us because, you know, power goes out, some stuff still works because it has a battery. And if the power had been out long enough and the laptop died, it might have clicked for him then. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of convinced that it's technology's fault. Be specific when you tell people how to work from home. Just a short memory I remembered in a cold sweat, but it still baffles me. We had a semi-large office, but for the most part, it was always full. And the only people who would work from home occasionally was me and a couple of managers. Now one day, we tell an employee to work from home for a bit, and they were given an explanation of how to remote in from home from their laptop with a secure connection. They just nodded their heads and agreed. That night, while I'm home, I go to push updates to every machine in the office, when I see that one machine in particular was not updating. I tried to remote into it, and nothing. Nada. So I lift myself up with a groan and physically go to the office thinking the PSU died or something. No. The entire setup was gone. The next day, I called the employee and asked what happened. They told me they took everything home in order to connect to the office. <laughs> Is quitting still an option? Oh, I feel for you, man. But yep, you're right. You got to be very specific with people. If you, if you leave any room for interpretation, they're going to interpret it totally different from the way you intended. Guaranteed. Yo, dog, I heard you like surge protectors. I work as a sysadmin for my county. I started this job not too long ago and haven't been around every location, so I may have new stories under my belt before too long. Today's story is about one of my users in an admin position. Today this user called me and alerted me to them having issues with their setup. For most of the county, our users are using a big name brand laptop hooked up to a fancy little dock station with two DisplayPort monitors that are also from big name brand. It's actually a sweet setup and allows users to easily work from home because they can just disconnect the laptop and be on their way. The user told me that their laptop would randomly freeze up, the dock would turn off, and their displays would go to sleep. No big deal, I thought. Maybe there's a firmware update that needs to be pushed through and hopefully fix the problem, or we just need to swap a cable out and just restart the machine. Nothing major, I assumed. So I go on a nice brisk walk over there from our department and greet the user, who shows me the problem. I note that they had actually described said problem in full detail. Yay! I immediately go to restart the machine first. It goes down and comes back up fine, and it seems to be working fine. During this period, the user and I are talking about our day and what we did over the weekend when it suddenly hits the fritz again and wigs out in front of me. At this point, it definitely seems to be having, like, an issue with the power going to the dock. Or the dock itself. I ask her to let me back into her area and where it's plugged into, and she shows me. This is where the horror began. Her dock and monitors were plugged into ye old beige surge protector. For the sake of this, we'll call it surge protector 1. Warm orange light indicating its function was not on, so I traced the cord to a small compartment area under the right side of her desk behind the drawer. Inside the compartment was another surge protector, surge protector 2. You may already have your hands approaching your face, but there's more. I noticed there's another multi-pack surge protector, 3 under there too that is also connected to Surge Protector 2. Surge Protector 3's main job was to connect the power from the printer. That's right above it. Yes, I too had no idea why this is needed. The power cord was obviously long enough to connect to Surge Protector 2. In an effort to undo this mess, I decide to trace the Surge Protector 2's cord and see where the heck that's going. There's lots of shelving in this office where the cables are routed behind. Well, it turns out Surge Protector 2 is connected to an extension cord. Now, I am by no means an electrical engineer, but not only am I sure that connecting two surge protectors together is a bad idea, let alone three, I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to use an extension cord for a surge protector either. Alas, as I'm wrapping my head around this, I continue my search for where this journey ends. I end up moving a couple shells to find a horrific conclusion. Surge protector 2's extension cord is plugged into another freaking surge protector. Number four. At this point, my feeble brain is trying to piece together this monstrosity of a system 
and trying to clean it up to the best of my ability. I removed Surge Protector 3 from the equation entirely, along with Surge Protector 4 as the extension cord could easily make it to the outlet that Surge Protector 4 was connected to. However, due to cord lengths, desk orientation, etc., I was only able to configure it so. Surge Protector 1, Surge Protector 2, Extension Cord to Outlet. This still made me uncomfortable and I requested the user to notify facilities immediately to get new outlets installed in her office and to notify me when they do. In the meantime, she said she'd happily work off just her laptop and charger connected directly to the outlet in the meantime. Holy cow! Now, I can't say too much. I've done some hinky electrical stuff to, you know, get power where I want it before, but I usually don't daisy chain a bunch of surge protectors together. I will use a heavy gauge extension cord to a surge protector, but like I said, heavy gauge. And then that's usually the end of it. From there, it's usually just whatever's right next to the surge protector plugged into it. Yeah, that sounds like a fire waiting to happen to me. My mom, the non-believer. Literally just got off the phone with my mom helping her out with this one. My semi-retired mom is working on a Word document that has two Excel spreadsheets embedded into it. She needs to email this document to her supervisor, but she's afraid that the Excel sheets didn't embed properly when she sent it, and she's panicking because the document is already late as it is. Because she's semi-retired and mainly uses her smartphone for everything these days, instead of her laptop, she's a bit rusty when it comes to Microsoft Office, and Windows for that matter. So she asked me for help on how to embed Excel sheets into Word. She's already spent quite a bit of time on YouTube looking up how to do this. Although my office knowledge is a bit rusty myself, I use Google Docs and Slides and Sheets for everything these days, I ask her to send me these files. And she sends me the Word file and two Excel files separately. When I open the Word document, I see that there are several charts which are already embedded, as well as two hyperlinks at the bottom of the document that link directly to the Excel sheets. I tried to explain to her that the two separate Excel files aren't needed, as there is already Excel data embedded in the Word document. She insists that the Excel sheets are still needed, as her supervisors need the ability to edit the data, and that the data won't copy over if she emails just the Word document. I come back by saying that the embedded data is editable by right-clicking the embedded sheet and clicking Edit Data, which opens the data up in Excel as a chart in Microsoft's Word, and they can then save the sheet separately if desired. My mom still doesn't believe me and is getting more and more stressed out. I finally explained to her that I deleted these separate Excel sheets and renamed the Word document, and the Word document still functioned perfectly, aside from the now broken hyperlinks at the bottom of the document, which aren't needed anyway. After a few more back and forths, with me even offering to email her the now renamed Word document, she finally says, I believe you. No wonder I have such a high tolerance of users that have both high anxiety and low PC knowledge. My mom has prepared me quite well for my field in that regard, which is one of the many reasons I still love her to death. Yeah, OP, I could probably sooner deal with the uh, lack of knowledge as opposed to the high anxiety. I don't deal well with people who have high anxiety. In fact, I myself have a little bit of an issue with anxiety and uh, working on getting that under control. But yeah, when I'm dealing with somebody else with anxiety, man, it makes mine go right through the roof. Beset on all sides by idiots, except the client and an unlikely turn of events. Happened today. The events that unfolded made me feel quite literally like my heart would burst and my head started aching with sort of a cold rage. So I shall be working for company A and the other shall be company B. Client contacts me saying that they lost their document and just applied for a replacement at the site of company B. The two issues are that the tracker says it happened 90 days ago and so can't be tracked and that the fee was 28 arbitrary units of money for some reason. Alright, first things first, the tracker is just wrong. Mostly because this site was made by company B, which is just about the worst IT company ever in the history of the universe. So bad that I, at company A, have to inform them as to what their services do and how they work when I ask for help with fixing them. The bigger issue is the fee. 28 is a familiar number, so I check. Yep, it used to be 28, but the law changed it at the start of this year to 8.5. I even checked with the head of the department who are in charge of knowing this specific thing and she agreed as well. Alright, two possibilities is a single glitch, or worse, but entirely possible considering that company B is involved. They did not notice the change in the laws that their services must observe. They did not update it, and they have been more than triple charging people for half a year now, and this is the first time someone brought it up. Alright, I can handle this. Reassure the client, ask them to send in the data so we can have this investigated and fixed. Great. Not half an hour passes and I'm contacted by a very reliable and knowledgeable colleague who asked me to check out an email. 
I assumed I messed something up, so I check. Nope. It's the email from the client. Some guy who I never even heard of sent out an answer saying that the guy in the chat was wrong, and it is 28. <laughs> the client even replied thanking him and noting how I was wrong in the chat then. Just in case I ask and colleague confirms that no, I was correct. The colleague who made the mistake is apparently a hire so new I've never even seen his name before. I have no idea what the heck he was even doing handling that email as it was not even part of his skill set. I am rather miffed, to say the least. Fine, the client sent a duplicate. I'm busy right now, but transfer that over to my main skill set. I'll get to it ASAP. Just in case, add a note explaining that 8.5 is the correct value and it has to be forwarded to company B. Not five minutes pass when I check, just in case. The contact has been answered, with a nonsense answer that I already correctly answered in the chat, by the way, by the same guy. At this point, I was more than a bit miffed. Not only is some complete noob who probably only plans to stick around as a summer job questioning my competence, he's also not even bothering to read the available email templates that show he's wrong. Or the information database we have that would also show it. Or even the contact history to see what was discussed in the chat. Or even to notice that he's already answered this exact email. Or just, you know, ask someone to make sure. No shame in that. So yeah, not taking responsibility or saving butts for that tragic comedy of errors by trying to fix it. I called the supervisor who was stupefied by the sheer degree of incompetence on display from both Company B and the colleague. Another experienced one happened to pass by at the time as well, who was also just starting with a sort of morbid curiosity at this train wreck. About the only silver lining in the whole matter was that, unbelievably, the client was the best bit of this whole ordeal. Also, the slice of pizza I stuffed into my face hole afterwards to calm down. So, as some of you may have guessed by now, we manufacture soap here, and I have people coming in all the time wanting to argue with me and tell me how the stuff is made, and that, you know, there's certain ingredients that can't be used or shouldn't be used because they're dangerous, and, you know, that's not vegan, that's not organic. They know nothing about anything, but they still want to argue and spout the wrong information constantly. Gotta love it. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with me today. If you've enjoyed this content, would you do me a favor and give this video a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and click that little bell icon so you don't miss the fat guy with the beard telling you stories. See ya!